Okay, we're in John chapter 2 and we're in session 4 tonight. John chapter 2, session 4. We've been working our way through this chapter. Let me say we're not going to do this probably with every chapter. Understand that because there, there's things even tonight where we're jumping here and there through the gospel and we're touching on things and obviously we'll, we'll touch in chapters certainly as we go along but it doesn't mean that we're going to try and, and cover absolutely everything in the gospel. But uh, you will remember that I had previously said that in this particular chapter of John, uh, there's three things that are being presented to us in this chapter about the Lord Jesus Christ. <coughs> the first miracle that he did back in the earlier part of the chapter, it said he showed forth his glory. So that's the first thing that was being presented to us by John about him. The second thing that we looked at the last time around was how he cleared the temple, his zeal for God, his zeal for the house of God, his zeal for the purpose of God, and all of those things. We've touched on those things. Remember, he, he drove out the money changers and all of that stuff that we, we touched on the last evening. And then the third thing, and this is really where we want to linger tonight, the third thing in the chapter in these closing verses is in connection with his knowledge. His knowledge. Okay. Now, we have an interesting portion here, uh, and it runs actually and from the end of chapter 2, I believe, right on into chapter 3, although we will not be in chapter 3 as such this evening. But I believe this entire section uh, ties together. I believe it's, it's placed together here by John, but I'll come back to that in a moment or two. But look at, look at verse, um, where are we at here? Verse 22. It says, When therefore Jesus was risen from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said unto them, uh, what he had said unto them, and they believed the scripture and the word which Jesus has said. That closes the previous section that we sort of looked at the last evening around. But look at verse 23. It says, Now when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover, in the feast day, many believed in his name when they saw the miracles which he did. But Jesus did not commit himself unto them because he knew all men and needed not that any should testify of man, for he knew what was in man. Now, go back and look at verse 23 again. When he was in Jerusalem at the Passover in the feast day, look at it, many believed in his name when they saw the miracles which he did. Let me just comment for just a, a brief moment on that phrase. Obviously, Jesus performed miracles that are not given in detail in this Gospel of John. You remember we said on a previous evening, John's very selective and he presents certain miracles. Now, he mentions these miracles, but they are not given here in detail. And many of them are probably not given in detail amongst the other Gospels either. But he had performed these miracles. And so we find in these verses, in response to these miracles or these signs, because that's really what John uh, refers to them as. But in response to these, we find at the end of chapter 2, verse 23, it says, at the end of the verse, it says, Many believed in his name when they saw the miracles that he did. Many believed. Then look at chapter 3, where you come into the story of Nicodemus, and we're just going to highlight verse 2. Nicodemus came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God, for no man can do these miracles that thou doest, except God be with him. So the miracles in chapter 2, obviously, that many believed in Jesus because of, we find that the same miracles draw Nicodemus. He's a, a leader it draws Nicodemus to Jesus. The same miracles does that to him. Now, look at verse 23 again and verse 24. Many believed in his name when they saw the miracles which he did. Verse 24, but Jesus did not commit himself unto them because he knew all men. So we have, we have two words there. I've said to you in your notes, if you look there, believed in verse 23, and the word commit, speaking of Jesus in verse 24, those are exactly the same word in the Greek language. I haven't given you the word, but the word is P-I-S-T-E-U-O, pistio, P-I-S-T-E-U-O. 
Same word used for the both of them. Um, the word simply means believe. It means trust. Uh, and it means because you believe you commit. You know, those, those two meanings of our English words are included in the meaning of this one word. But I'm, I'm trying to emphasize the fact that it's the same Greek word that's used for both of those, believed and commit. So what it's actually saying is here that there are some of these people who believed in Jesus, but Jesus did not believe in them. Okay. Um, Warren Wearsby, whenever you read his commentary in this particular little section here, Warren Wearsby calls these people unsaved believers. That's a bit of a conflict of terms there, but really that's what we're talking about here. Because the Bible says they believed, but somewhere in the midst of it all, they are not saved. They are not believing uh, to saving faith. We're going to look at that in a moment or two. But that's how he refers to them. And the verses here go on to say that no matter what these people say, and no matter what all those people say about them, Jesus did not accept their testimony. Jesus, verse 24, did not commit himself unto them because he knew all men, and he needed not that any should testify of man, for he knew what was in man. Jesus did not accept their testimony because being God, he knows what's in every single person's heart, and he knows what's in every single person's mind. It's as simple as that. You see, it's one thing to respond to a miracle but it's a completely different thing to commit yourself or surrender yourself to the Lordship of Jesus Christ and continue in his word. Look at chapter 8. Flick across. Keep your finger in there because we'll, we'll be back there in a moment or two. But look at chapter 8, verse 31. Chapter 8, verse 31. Then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him. Now, it's not the same ones that we're reading about back there. But then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him, If you continue in my word, then are ye my disciples indeed. And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. That's what he says in, in chapter 8. Now, coming back again to chapter 2. Let me go further back into chapter 2. What does it say about the disciples after the first miracle which he did? If you look at verse 11 of chapter 2, it says, This beginning of miracles did Jesus in Cana of Galilee, manifested forth his glory, and his disciples, there's the word again, believed in him. Some of the translations, by the way, at the end of chapter 2 here, I think uses the word trust, but it's all, it's all the same kind of thing, believe, trust, commit, and so on. So what I'm trying to say here is the same word in the Greek is used in all instances in this chapter whenever it refers to people believing. Okay, now, to me, that poses a problem because then I have to think to myself, is there different types of belief? Are there different depths of belief? Are there different degrees? You know, all of this stuff, I don't know, that, all of that stuff comes into my mind. And we know, of course, there's believing in the mind, there's believing with the heart. We understand all of that stuff comes into play here. But you see, let me just move back a wee minute or two, because in John chapter 1, John has presented Jesus as the Word from before the foundation of the world who made all things. And he has presented Jesus as the Lord. Whenever you come into chapter 2 of the Gospel, John, he has shown us who Jesus is in chapter 1, and now in chapter 2, he's proving that Jesus is exactly who he has stated he is in chapter 1. And so we see the first miracle. We see a zeal for God. That was all that mattered as far as the temple was concerned, the things of God, the work of God. And now we see him knowing the very heart of people. And John is proving now that Jesus is exactly who he has introduced to us in chapter 1. Does that make sense? That okay? Okay. Let me move the screen on for just a moment or two. Now, I want you to turn for a moment in your Old Testament, the book of Nahum. The book of Nahum in your Old Testament 
There'll be a book that you're probably in two or three times a week whenever you're doing your daily reading. <laughs> Isn't that right? <laughs> it's one of those minor prophets, one of those minor prophet books, to be quite honest, that um, if you're like me, you, you, probably, you probably don't pay a lot of attention to it. If you're also like me, you've probably read through it at times and thought, what on earth really is going on there? Because I, I, I find there's lots of prophecy that are, it's made in the Old Testament. And I, I'll be honest with you, I just have difficulty with a lot of that stuff, you know, I really do. But let me give you just a wee, a wee bit of something about the book of Nahum. The book of Nahum was probably written roughly about 665 BC. The only thing that we're told, if you look at verse 1, the only thing we're told about this prophet called Nahum is that he was an Elkosite. Okay, now that simply mean, that meant that he came from a place called Elkos. Nobody today is completely sure where that was, although it's generally accepted it was up in the northern area of Israel, up around the Galilee area, somewhere up around there. There has been evidence found amongst the ruins of Capernaum up in that area that referred to this, and they reckon that that is probably the area that he came from. And whenever you read through these opening verses, he, he speaks about some of the landmarks uh, that are they're up in that part of the world. So it's generally uh, accepted that that was where he probably came from, but nobody can be completely sure about that. Now, we know roughly the date, because if you look at chapter 3 of the book, have I given you this? No, look at chapter 3 of the book and look at verse 8. I'm sorry, I should have had this in your notes. It says in verse 8, the King James says, Art thou better than populous no, that was situate among the rivers, that had the waters round about it, whose rampart was the sea, and her wall was from the sea. Now, populous no, that, that is just a bad translation, even by the authorised version. <laughs> okay, but it, but it really is. And, and what that actually should be is no Amman. Oh, sorry, no Amon, I beg your pardon. That was the name, no Amon. Okay, no Amon was an Egyptian, or was the Egyptian city of Thebes, T-H-E-B-E-S, Noamon. And it was called Noamon because they worshipped the god Amon in that particular area of Egypt. Okay, the King James calls it populous No, referring to the fact that it's a, you know, it's, it was a major city in its day, but the proper name for it was the city of Thebes or No. Amon. Okay, now, the Assyrian monarch at that particular time, Asher Panapal. How would you like, I, I, I have bothered with a name like Denver. How would you like a name like Asher Panapal? But that's what they call this man. And he overthrew that particular city in 665, 664 BC. And Nahum refers to it here in chapter 3. And so they can date the book they can date the prophecy in the book of Nahum back to roughly that period of time. Now, Nahum, the book itself, this prophecy, is a doom song from start to finish. It's very poetic, apparently, in the way it's put together in the original Hebrew and so on, but it's a doom song, and it's against the city of Nineveh. Now, Nineveh was the capital city of the major power at that time, Assyria, reckoned at that particular time, you know, we, we talk about Babylon and how great Babylon was in its day. Well, whenever the Assyrians were in power, they reckoned that Nineveh was the greatest city in the world as well. So that, that's really what we're looking at here. And you will find it in the book of Nahum, Nahum, I beg your pardon, chapter 1, doom is declared by the prophet Nahum against Nineveh. In chapter 2, I'm giving you all this, you can do all this on your own, you see. Chapter 2, okay, doom is described on the city by the prophet. And in chapter 3, Nineveh, doom is deserved as stated by the prophet. That's basically what the, how the book breaks up, the three chapters. Okay. And let me say this to you. If you're reading the book of Nahum, you're better to read it 
in a modern version <laughs> rather than the authorised version. I really mean that because it's much easier to read and understand. But let me say something else about it for a moment. And, and I'm, I'm going to just throw something on you here. What other book refers to Nineveh in your Old Testament? Jonah. Jonah. And you see, what has happened to Nahum here is the fact that Jonah in his day had gone and preached. You know the story here, he rebelled against God and went to the ship and all of that stuff. But eventually, whenever he went to Nineveh and preached, the people of Nineveh accepted the word of God and <coughs> repented. And the judgment that God had pronounced upon them or would have pronounced upon them, they were spared at that time. Now, the people at that time in Nineveh had turned to the Lord, but time passed. And eventually, according to history, you know, whenever others grew up and a generation moved, passed away and so on, the city returned again to what it always had been and probably even much worse than it had originally been. And so now Nahum comes on the scene. God has been gracious to them in the past, but now because of what they've done, they're going to be judged. And so if you're reading the book of Nahum, you know, keep it in conjunction with Jonah. It's good to pair stuff up like that. And you can pair those two books up. But let me say again that Nahum is probably better reading it definitely in, in a modern translation, some of those, rather than in the King James. But that's just a bit of background to the book. Really what we want to get at here, chapter 1 opens with a section about God. Look at verse 2. Verse 1 tells you who Nahum is. Verse 2 it says, God is jealous, and the Lord revengeth. Remember now, remember Jonah in his day had preached forgiveness and mercy and grace to them. Now it says, God is jealous, and the Lord revenges, and the Lord revengeth and is furious. The Lord will take vengeance on his adversaries, and he reserves wrath for his enemies. Now, this is what Jonah told them. The Lord is slow to anger. But now Nahum says he's great in power. And he will not acquit the wicked. The Lord has his way in the whirlwind and in the storm. And the clouds are the dust of his feet. He rebukes the sea. He makes it dry. And he dries up all the rivers. Bashan languisheth and Carmel and the flower of Lebanon languisheth. Those are some of the landmarks that Nahum uses, so to speak, in this prophecy, because those are up in the northern territory of Israel. Verse 5, the mountains quake at him, and the hills melt, and the earth is burned at his presence, yea, the world and all that dwell therein. Who can stand before his indignation? And who can abide in the fierceness of his anger? His fury is poured out like fire, and the rocks are thrown down by him. The Lord is good, a stronghold in the day of trouble. Look at the next phrase. And he knoweth them that trust in him. And I've told you all of that about Nahum to help you whenever you're reading and studying it. But it's that little phrase at the end of verse 7 that I really wanted to get to here. In this section where, where Nahum is, is describing God, it's going to be God's judgment, it's going to be God's vengeance, it's going to be God's power, it's going to be God who's or, going to orchestrate this upon the city of Nineveh. Right at the very end of it, he says, And the Lord knows them that trust in him. It's an interesting little thought that he knows them that trust in him. Because you see, whenever you come back, and you can go back to chapter 2 here, it says that Jesus, verse 25 of chapter 2, I beg your pardon, of John, chapter 2 of John, verse 25 it says, For Jesus knew what was in man. The Lord knows them that trust in him. Okay, so the two, the two verses there, they, 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 they come up, they tie up, up together. He knows them that trust in him. Verse 24 in John chapter 2 is the proof of that verse that we've just read in chapter 1 of Nahum. Nahum chapter 1 verse 7. Verse 24 is a proof of that verse and it's also a proof of who Jesus is. 
because it's the Lord who knows them that trust in him. So Jesus here, you see, John's presenting him. Let me say, John has told us who he is. And in this chapter, John has shown us that he really is who he says he is. And he presents him here right at the end of the chapter. In these two or three verses, for some reason, he presents this to us to show us that he is indeed Lord. He knows man. He knows them that trust in him. And then verse 25 again says, And he needs not that any should testify of man, for he knew what was in man. Jesus did not, verse 24, he did not commit himself unto them because he knew all men. Verse 25, and he needed not that any should testify of man, for he knew what was in man. Now, having said all of that, we look at those two or three verses at the end of chapter 2. And I believe as a consequence of what those verses say to us, I'm going to throw out three things to you here that I believe those verses suggest to us. And the first thing that we would all agree with is quite simply this. The verses suggest to us that believing is not enough because it says these people believed. Jesus didn't believe them or believe in them. So believing in the Lord is not enough. This thing that we call belief is not enough. The second thing, B, on your notes there that I believe the verse suggests to us is that, again, we'll agree with this, we've just looked at it, Jesus as God knows the inner heart of every single person. Okay? I think we can all agree with that. But I think the third thing that it shows to us is simply this. Salvation depends on Jesus' response to our believing. He did not commit himself to any of them because he knew what was in their heart. You see, you and I, we look at salvation, we look at how we got saved, and somehow, some way, we believed, is there different degrees, different depths? Same words used right through here. Humanly speaking, we believed, but it was the fact that there was a response to that belief that brought salvation into your life and into mine. Does that make sense? Can, can, you under, can you go with that? Are you happy enough with that? You see, he did not commit himself to any of them. And so I believe salvation depends upon his response whenever whatever happens in our lives brings us into faith in him. You see, salvation, whenever you look at it like that, salvation then is a complete work of God. Whenever we're first saved, you know, we... We, we, we think, you know, we, we chose the Lord. Don't we, like, really? But I think as time goes on, we really do understand that God had a far bigger part to play in that than what we had, if we had any part, really, to play in it at all. And salvation is a complete work of God. I need to move that on. That's my next screen. Salvation is a complete work of God. Not simply a belief on the part of the individual person, But there's something much more to salvation. It's the response of God to that heart that God has brought into that degree of belief, if you want to put it like that. And we could go through the scriptures and we could pluck out many verses like this. I've just given you one or two here. Let's go for a moment to 2 Corinthians chapter 1. And let's look at verses 21 and 22. If any of you can cast your mind back to the time that we did uh, the series on understanding the Holy Spirit a number of years ago, one of the sessions that we did right at the beginning uh, of that whole series was to show, we plucked out a number of verses in the New Testament to show that the Holy Spirit is just as important in the salvation of a soul as the Lord Jesus Christ was upon the cross of Calvary. Jesus paid the price but it's the Holy Spirit who brings the reality of that into the heart of the believer. And so in 2 Corinthians 1 verse uh, 21, it says this, Now he which establishes us with you in Christ and has anointed us is God, who has also sealed us 
and given us the earnest of the Spirit in our hearts. We've, we know, you know, the seal, the down payment and all of that of, of, the, of the Spirit in our hearts. You see, it's the response of God. It's what God does in the life that saves the life. It's not the belief that somehow is in the heart. It's what God actually does. Salvation is of the Lord. Look at 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 for a moment. Second Thessalonians chapter 2. Verse 13 says, But we are bound to give thanks always to God for you, brethren beloved of the Lord, because God hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation through sanctification of the Spirit and belief of the truth, whereunto he called you by our gospel to the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. There's another one of those verses. God has chosen you to salvation through sanctification of the Spirit. He has chosen you from the beginning. The salvation that you enjoy, that I enjoy, that you experience, that I experience, is a complete work of God from start to finish. Complete work of God. Look at 1 Peter 1 verse 2. 1 Peter 1 verse 2. One Peter chapter one verse two it says elect right into these believers elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father through sanctification of the Spirit unto obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ there's the Father the Spirit and the Son all in that verse he says grace unto you and peace be multiplied and our salvation is a complete work. A complete act. The Bible says salvation is of the Lord. It hinges completely upon him. And you see, it's God's work, God's Spirit, that convicts. And it's God's Spirit who causes belief. And then God works further in response to that belief to bring those whom he has called fully into this thing that we call salvation. Did, does that make, is that all right? Now you're going to say, you know, do you believe in predestination? Yes, I do. I believe in predestination. I will not really preach that in a gospel service. I don't think you need to preach those things in a gospel service, but I believe God chooses people. Not because of any merit that's in us, but God chooses people whom he has before ordained. You know, he has the Bible in Ephesians chapter 1 says that he has, he has chosen us and he has brought us into good works which he had before ordained that we should walk in them. Before ever you were born, I believe with all of my heart that there was a path planned for your life, planned for my life. There was works that you were to be involved in. There was works that I was to be involved in. And I'd be quite honest with you, I think I had no real part to play in that all in the fact that God moved upon my life and degree after degree after degree, he brought me along that path that brings me in salvation to where I am today. And I believe he does that for every single one of us. Well, I stop and let you debate that or do you want to, do you want to say anything about that? I just believe that's the way salvation is. I really do. Does that mean that we shouldn't pray for people? No, doesn't mean that. Because God needs to move in hearts. And the work and the influence of the enemy, you know, the works of darkness is there. It influences people. It, it forms mindsets. It causes people to reject and turn against God in so many ways. And for some reason, God wants you and me as his people to partner with him in the furtherance of his kingdom and to pray against those things and to pray for the people, you know, and, and, and somehow... We play a part. It's not that we really do anything with their salvation, but we partner with God to some extent in praying stuff like that through that God moves and saves to bring about his purpose and to bring about his plan in people's lives. But I believe that salvation is a complete work of God from start to finish. Did you believe? 
whenever you were saved. Of course you did. But where did your belief come from? Because you see, you and I, at the very best, we can only muster up a natural belief that we see in this chapter here, it's in front of us tonight, chapter 2. That's the best we have to offer. We can be convinced about something, and that's belief. <coughs> but the thing that brings us from belief into new life in Christ is the response of Jesus Christ somehow to that belief, and the Holy Spirit comes to work. You see, the very next chapter, and we'll touch on this in a moment or two, the very next chapter, Nicodemus comes, and Jesus now explains how belief, if you like, turns into new life in Christ. There has to be a new birth. It's a spiritual birth. It's the work of God in the life of the individual. Okay, but anyway, salvation is a work of God. It's God's work, and he convicts, and he moves upon us, and he brings us into the kingdom of the spiritual. There comes a stage in our lives. He brings us to a place of belief, and somehow we come to a stage in life where we pass from the natural into the spiritual, into the rebirth. And everything has to do with him, because it's he who's at work in our lives from start to finish. And we're brought into the spiritual, we're brought out of, you know, out of the kingdom of darkness, we're brought out of the kingdom of the natural, we're brought into the kingdom of the spiritual, we're brought into his kingdom. And then you find that the next chapters I've said in chapter 3 goes on to show Nicodemus how that all works. Look at verse 6 of chapter 3. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the spirit is spirit. Now here's the question. Were you able to make yourself be born of the flesh? And the answer is no. <coughs> Neither can you make yourself to be born of the spirit by believing. It's a work of God. It's a response of God. It's the moving of the Holy Spirit upon the life from start to finish that brings us right through into that. And so I believe that that's what John is showing to us here. That's why I said it's an interesting portion of scripture from the end of chapter 2 down into the Nicodemus story in, in chapter 3. And salvation depends completely upon what he does. Now he reveals himself through his word that we might believe. And remember, over towards the end of John's gospel it says, and that believing you might have life through his name. Somehow in that process of believing, he takes us further and takes us out into this thing that we call salvation. The word believe, by the way, if you're reading John's gospel, the word believe runs right through this gospel. It's everywhere in this gospel. It's mentioned again and again and again. And it's presented to us in this chapter here in verse 11. It's presented to us in chapter 2, I beg your pardon, of John's gospel. It's mentioned to us in verse 11. It's mentioned to us in verse 22. And it's mentioned to us in verse 23. And it's mentioned to us the word commit in verse 24. Four times in this one chapter about this thing believing. That believing you might have life through his name. The point is this, seeing the miracles, seeing the signs, and believing in them would be a, you know, a good start. Wouldn't it have been glorious to have seen some of the things that Jesus did? I believe it would have been absolutely tremendous. But it takes more than believing in miracles for a person to be saved. It's a complete act of Almighty God. And we'll debate that afterwards if you want, if there's anybody, you know. But I mean, that, that, that's simply how, how I see all of that stuff. Let's move on for a moment or two very quickly to, to we draw it to a close. You also find in this gospel the Jewish people divided. Divided. We've been talking here about miracles. These believe because of the miracles. Nicodemus comes because of the miracles. But you'll find that the Jewish people, they, they, they are divided because of the miracles. They're divided over the meaning of the miracles. Look at chapter 9 for a moment or two. John chapter 9, look at verse 16. It says, Therefore said some of the Pharisees, This man is not of God, because he keeps not the Sabbath day. Others said, How can a man that is a sinner do such miracles? And there was a division amongst them. 
Move two chapters over, chapter 11, verse 45. Then many of the Jews which came to Mary and had seen the things which Jesus did believed on him. But some of them went their ways to the Pharisees and told them what things Jesus had done. His miracles divided people. People couldn't understand his miracles. The same miracles that attracted Nicodemus to Jesus caused some of the other religious leaders to want to kill him. The amazing thing, all of this stuff. Some, as we've read, some said they were done by the power of, of Satan. But his miracles were testimonies. Go back to John chapter 5 and look at verse 36. John chapter 5 and verse 36. Jesus says unto them, he says, But I have greater witness than that of John. For the works which the Father has given me to finish, the same works that I do, bear witness of me that the Father has sent me. The very miracles were testimonies as to who he was. The power demonstrated and the work that he would do through those miracles and eventually finishing upon the cross of Calvary to fulfill the Father's work. They were evidence of his divine sonship. But let me move on. They were also tests. The miracles explored or exposed the hearts of the people. Look at chapter 12. Chapter 12, verse 37. But though he had done so many miracles before them, yet they believed not on him, that the saying of Isaiah the prophet might be fulfilled, which he spake, Lord, who has believed our report? And to whom hath the arm of the Lord been revealed? Therefore they could not believe, because it Isaiah said again, He has blinded their eyes, he has hardened their heart, that they should not see with their eyes, nor understand with their heart, and be converted. And I should heal them. These things said Isaiah when he saw his glory and spake of him. That's referenced, by the way, to, to Isaiah chapter 6. Okay, Isaiah mentioned those things in chapter 6 of, his, of his, his prophecy back in the Old Testament. So there's stuff going on here. Some people are meant to see and some people are definitely not meant to see, not allowed to see. Okay, so the same events, let me put it this way, the same events that opened some eyes only made all our eyes that much more blind. And it divided the people that were there. Chapter 9 again, go back to chapter 9. Maybe I've read that one, have I? Let me see this, John chapter 9, verse 39. No, John chapter 9, verse 39. Let's, let's just read that one. And Jesus said, For judgment I am come into this world, that they which see not might see, and they which see might be made blind. And some of the Pharisees which were with him heard these words and said unto him, Are we blind also? And Jesus said unto them, If you were blind, you should have no sin. But now you say, We see. Therefore, your sin remaineth. So all of this stuff was at play and all of this stuff was at work and there was a division amongst the people because of the miracles that he was doing and he, he confronts them with some of this stuff and it seems very clear. It's the same in Matthew's gospel. You know, whenever we did our brief season through Matthew's gospel, there comes a stage in Matthew's gospel where he stops talking to the leaders, the religious people. And everything in Matthew's gospel after that is shared in parables because there are certain there who are not going to see truth and there are other people that truth is being revealed to. And John in this gospel is running through that same, same kind, kind of scenario, that same kind of thing. There are people who will see and people who think they see who don't see a thing. And there's a division even amongst where the power for the miracles is coming from and what good the miracles are doing. He's a man of God. No, we'll just kill him. We'll get rid of him. So all of this stuff's playing in the background. 
It's also important to notice um, that Jesus tied his miracles to the truth of his message. And again, that's, we've touched on this before. That's why uh, the miracles are the signs that John chooses here. He has them selected in the way he has because Jesus ties them to the truth of his message. You see, the human heart is attracted to the sensational. That's just our makeup. That's the way we are. And so the 5,000 he fed in chapter 6, you know, they wanted to make him king until he tied that miracle into the truth of what he wanted to preach. And he preached a sermon to them on the bread of life. And boy, they couldn't get away from him quick enough. They left him in droves after that. Are we going to eat your flesh? Are we going to drink your blood? Because they couldn't see. The miraculous drew them. They believed in him, but there was something lacking because they couldn't see. God wasn't allowing them to see what they needed to see, the truth and the message that Jesus was presenting. You see, John chapter 1, verse 17, he has told us right in the opening chapter, referring to Jesus, he says he was full of grace and truth. And you see, in grace, he did the miracles and he helped the people. In truth, he preached the word of God to them. And there's a complete difference between believing because of what they see and understanding what he teaches. And so we find in the whole gospel itself that there, there, there's this, this, this complete turning point. The people wanted him for the physical food. They wanted, him, they wanted to make him king because of what he had done for them. But they didn't want the spiritual truth. And so they abandoned him, the spiritual truth. Let's, let's move on very quickly. We'll draw, draw this to a close very quick. So chapter 2, verse 25 that we started in tonight says, He knew what was in man. And that statement is proved a number of times through the gospel. Let's, let's run through these very, very, very quickly. Chapter 1, if you want to go back there in the gospel, verse 42, although we have touched on this in a previous evening, we're just highlighting these for you. Uh, that, there's, there's the instance of Simon. And he brought him to Jesus, and when Jesus beheld him, he said, Thou art Simon, the son of Jonah, thou shalt be called Cephas, which is by interpretation a stone. Okay. Now there Jesus knew him. It would seem as if there was a purpose for him. He was a chosen vessel. Look at 46. And Nathanael said unto him, Can any good thing come out of Nazareth? Philip said unto him, Come and see. Jesus saw Nathanael coming to him and said unto him, Behold, an Israelite indeed, in whom there is no guile. How did he know that? He brought Nathaniel to him. It would seem as if he had never met him before. You see, he knows what's in the heart of man. Nathaniel said unto him, Whence knowest thou me? And Jesus answered and said, Before that Philip called you, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. Okay, chapter 4, verse 29. 4, verse 29. Woman at the well. And she says, Come see a man which told me all things that ever I did. Is not this the Christ? He knew what was in man. Chapter 5, the very next chapter, verse 42. And it says in, in that verse, But I know you, that you have not the love of God in you. He says, I receive not honor from men, but I know you, that you have not the love of God in you. The very next chapter, chapter 6, look at verse 64 of that chapter. But there are some of you that believe not. For Jesus knew from the beginning who they were that believed not, and even who should betray him. He knew that one of his disciples, he says, have I not chosen you, you twelve? He says, one of you is a devil. That was long before anything was ever manifest by way of anybody else knowing who it was or what was going on. Chapter 8, look at verse 10. When Jesus had lifted up himself and saw none but the woman, the woman taken in adultery, woman, he said unto her, Woman, where, where are those thine accusers? Has no man condemned you? She said, No man, Lord. And Jesus said unto her, Neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. He recognized repentance in the heart of that woman at that particular time. Look at verse uh, verse 40 of that same chapter. Chapter 8, verse 40. But now you seek to kill me, a man that has told you the truth, 
which I have heard of God. And he says, this did not Abraham. He knows that they're, they're plotting murder. He knows what, what's in their heart. He knows what's going on with them. And I haven't given you the reference because it spans a chapter or two, but several times with his disciples in the upper room, he reveals to his disciples their inner feelings and even the questionings that they have in their heart. And so those are all things that, that highlight the fact that he knew all men. Let, let's finish very, 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 very quickly. I think this is the last screen, isn't it? Yeah, it is. Okay. As you follow as you follow Christ's ministry in this gospel, as in the others, you will see that Jesus moves gradually out of the bright light of popularity. And he moves, as it were, into the, the dark shadows of rejection, if you want to call it that. And at the beginning it was easy for people to follow the crowd and to watch the miracles and to express some kind of belief in him. But then his words began to penetrate hearts with conviction following what he was teaching to them. Now I've given you a little thought there. Conviction always leads to either conversion or else opposition. Always. There's no neutral ground. You can't stand in the middle. Whenever God brings about conviction, there will either be conversion or there will be opposition. But it's impossible to be neutral. And people had to decide, and most decided against him. And so you'll find the latter half of the gospel, you know, he's withdrawn more, he's teaching more, his own disciples, his own followers, he's explaining stuff to them, he's preparing for the cross and all of that. But by and large, he's in this gospel, he's shown as being more withdrawn from the popularity and from the crowd that he had moved amongst in the earlier parts of the gospel. But he knows the human heart. Look again at John chapter 4. This is, the, you know, after the woman at the well. John chapter 4 uh, and verse 48. It says, Then said Jesus unto him, Except you see signs, except you see signs and wonders, you will not believe. He knows the human heart. Remember, we're thinking tonight about his knowledge. He knows the human heart. And you see, they said to us, or they said to him often, show us a sign. Isn't that right? You read that in the other Gospels as well. Look at chapter 11 and verse 40. You see, Jesus says there that we've just read, he says, you see signs and wonders. Unless you see them, you'll not believe. Look at chapter 11, verse 40. <coughs> Jesus said unto her, said I not unto you that if you would believe, then you should see the glory of God. They, say, they were looking at the signs. The signs will make us believe. No, no, Jesus says, you believe and you'll see all the signs you need to see after that. Look at chapter 20. And again, we're coming close to that verse that we have cited so often. It's verse 29 of the chapter this time. And it said, Jesus said unto him, he has appeared in the room. Jesus said unto him, Thomas, because you have seen me, you have believed. But he says, blessed are they that have not seen and yet have believed. You see, first we believe, then we see. And miracles are to lead us, or time is gone, you have the references there, but miracles are actually to lead us to the Word. John chapter 5, verses 36 to 38, and then the Word generates the saving faith. Romans 10 and verse 17, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. And it's all a process of Almighty God from start to finish because He knows the heart and He knows what's going on. So our Lord's accurate knowledge of the human heart is another evidence, I've said to you there, of His, his deity. Another evidence of His deity. For only God can really see the inner person. But that verse at the end of chapter 2, and we are finished, but that verse at the end of chapter 2 prepares us for the important meeting that we see then in chapter 3 that Jesus has with Nicodemus, where the spirit your life is explained. And you'll find at the end uh, of chapter 2 and into chapter 3, you have the repetition of the word man. Many believed in him, 
But Jesus did not commit himself to them because he knows man and he knows what's in man. And he doesn't need any to testify of man because he knows man. And then in chapter 3, there was a man of the Pharisees called Nicodemus. And the whole thing ties together and it explains the process of salvation and how it comes about and how it takes much, much more than what the natural mind thinks is simply believing in Christ. It's a belief that's much deeper than that. It's a heart belief and it's something that has been generated and brought to that place by Almighty God himself. And he responds to that to bring us through into the new birth. Amen. Amen. Is there anything there that anybody would want to say or Would I be right tonight in saying that the longer you're on the road, the more you realize that it is of God? Would I be right in saying that? Because <laughs> I know that's, that's what I personally feel that, that I have found. It. You know, Greta and I argue about this stuff. No, we don't. But, <laughs> Money joke. but, but no, you know, really and truly, as I've said, when, whenever you first get saved, you know, somehow truth began to be revealed to you and you began to see stuff and think about stuff and somehow you chose Christ. And yet, you know, that's our perception of it until you really get into the scriptures and you see, no, you know, if you were left to your own devices, you would never choose God. Never, because that's our nature. But in the midst of all of that, we have a God who's continually chasing after us because he has chosen us and his salvation is a complete work from start to finish. You know, he gives us the faith to be saved. He gives us a belief and he responds to bring us right on through into this thing that we call salvation. Okay. Any comments, anybody? Now, I'm giving you all the option I can give you. <laughs> okay, let's have a word of prayer together. <coughs> Father, we just thank you tonight. Lord, really, really, Lord, you know, whenever we, we, we get down to looking at scriptures like that, and there are so many more that we could look at, Lord, salvation is really such a privilege. It really is, Lord. To be yours, to be saved, Lord, to have received mercy through what you have done for us at the cross, to have been called on to that, and yet to realize that you had ordained that before ever you had formed this word. And Lord, our minds can't understand that. Our minds can't fathom that fully. Lord, no matter how much scripture we look at and no matter how well we think we've got a handle on it, Lord, we realize there's truth and there's depth in there that we just can't plumb, that we can't understand. But Lord, we just have to say tonight, we have to look heavenward and say, thank you, Lord, for this wonderful and great salvation. Lord, we ask your blessing upon what we've looked at tonight. And we pray, Lord, that it will touch our lives. Lord, maybe we'll go away and meditate upon it. Lord, maybe we'll go away and disagree with some of it. Lord, that's good too, because if that drives us back to the scriptures to find out more or to fortify our own belief, Lord, that can do nothing but good. And so, Lord, we thank you for your word this evening. We ask your blessing upon it. We thank you for everyone who's here. And we commit every single life to you now as we draw our time to a close. In Jesus' holy name. Amen. Amen. <coughs> Praise God.